Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess and I'm here today with Dr. Claire Minchell from Get Back to Sport and she's a rehabilitation and conditioning specialist who I've had a few chats with recently and um, they've been quite extensive because there's a lot of uh, prevention and injury that goes on within sport and uh, pastimes that people kind of take up without knowing what they're doing so I'm really interested to see what we're going to talk about today Um, because from a personal point of view uh, it's quite important. (laughs) So Claire welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Mate, it's, it's an absolute pleasure and I'm looking forward to this. So tell us a bit about you, because people may not have heard of you before. What's your background? Give us, give us the, the, the lowdown. Right, well, a potted history. Um, so obviously uh, I've got a PhD in sports medicine uh, and that where I've come to now to get back to sport is uh, very much a journey of experiencing uh, a lot of different things up to that point. What I mean by that is, sorry, I was, had a great interest in injury and in prevention, particularly in the knees, um, when I was a, a, an undergraduate at, at university. So that led me on to studying sports medicine and rehabilitation uh, at PhD level, um, designing research and, and um, constructing new methods for uh, rehabilitation of the anterior cruciate ligament following um, following surgery so some of you may be experienced uh, or experience know what that's like uh, i certainly do i, I ruptured my own um, it's a really common injury in uh, in sport so that then um led me to um to, i suppose working with elite athletes as well as working in an academic setting so i was a senior lecturer um at uh, nottingham Trent university for around about nine ish years um, and within that, kind of again, researching um, what makes joints stable, what makes them unstable, what makes, therefore, um, the best preventative interventions and thus the best rehabilitative interventions. So what we can really do with uh, the muscles and the joints to intervene to help protect us against injury. Um, so that was really detailed uh, evaluation of muscle firing patterns and muscle stimulation and stuff like that. And again, we looked at um, elite athletes through to those people that are you know, uh, undergoing surgery. So uh, along the performance spectrum of sports and indeed actually more recently, those joint replacement patients, mm. which um, might not be the typical profile that you think, perhaps the older lady who's hobbling up on the street, uh, actually a uh, um, we're seeing more and more joint replacements earlier in life as people put more demands on their bodies. Um, so if you just put obesity and that kind of um, category to, to one side just for a moment, um, the risk of developing, for example, osteoarthritis of the knee earlier in life might be slightly elevated if you've got a very physically active um, adolescence and, and uh, 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 life in 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, which is associated just with volume of loading, and indeed if you've had a sports injury too, like an ACL injury. So, um, my, yeah, my interests uh, lie in sports medicine. I led major clinical collaborations between um, universities and hospitals, both in Edinburgh um, and in, in the UK, and currently leading a, a clinical trial looking at the best way of rehabilitating again from, from ACL rehab. So. It's called the cross-education effect, very, very commonly uh, known within sports medicine, set, or certainly sports performance settings. So that's if you start out a resistance training program, having never done resistance training before, and if you just train one side, um, certainly the, the, there's an opportunity for development in the opposite side. So that first kind of six weeks of any resistance training program, regardless of whether it's full body, is due to that neural adaptation so that's getting the signals to the muscles, getting the muscles firing properly, getting them firing in, the, the units of the muscles firing in unison, and all that's about delivery of signals. Um, so we're just looking at whether or not um, in a, a surgical population where you've got one limb that's not quite immobilized but efficient, if we hammer the other limb, if there's a cross-education effect there, so that's, that's that. Um, research and all that background and my working within and with outside the NHS has led me to set up um, about a year ago get back to sport and get back to sport aims to 
or certainly does train fitness professionals to be able to manage injury. So if you are a fitness professional, you probably see people who are injured on a daily basis. And that's because more people are being slightly more active, I guess. Uh, but also we've got a massive problem within the NHS and funding. So there's a decline in funding um, and these musculoskeletal problems are not being able to be managed more um, adequately within the NHS. And not only that, um, we've got a lack of money, we've got a lack of resources, we've got a lack of personnel, some amazing people in the NHS, and I'm really privileged to say that I work uh, in unison with them, but it, the demand <laughs> is too great. Yeah. So what's happening, people, people are trying to find their own solutions. So if, a typical example would be, you've got a sore knee, you go to your GPs, what, what happens? Your GPs give you some paracetamol and send you on your way. And that treats the symptom, not the cause. And you know better in six weeks, you go back to your GP, so if you can follow this cycle, you might get some physio if you're lucky, and you might get one session which is not enough. So personal trainers, fitness professionals, and you as an individual might have experienced that journey. Um, so we need a new solution to be able to manage those problems. And why not capitalize on it as well? So all those people in the fitness profession who are seeing these people with musculoskeletal problems, they're not trained as a on their pathway of a training to be able to manage those problems. So that's where I get back problems in. And that's bringing, if I reflect back on where I've come from, all that knowledge that I've accrued, researched, evaluated, and evidence goes into that training to give these people give you the, the very best training so you can accommodate those injuries, you can upskill, you can help get them better, you can work in unison with physiotherapy, and you can be the go-to <laughs> Yeah. Uh, fitness professional personal trainer in the industry so that's sort of potted history rubble, rubbled out of it but that's kind of my background really you know you know what's interesting from my perspective when a client has a preconceived idea about a personal trainer or a coach they will go and see them for exercise so they'll go there and say right you know what the normal thing is i need to lose weight and tone up okay that's the biggest thing people want right Unless they're obviously some sort of athletic sports uh, performance thing. So they go to the gym and the personal trainer who is getting paid £12 an hour or whatever it is by the the big uh, chain of gyms sits there and says, right, let's um, do a small assessment on you, which they may well do. Um, very basic. And then, right, get in the treadmill. Let's do some resistance work. Get you on a Swiss ball, whatever it is. Thanks very much. See you next week. What people don't get is that it is so one-dimensional when all you do is exercise a client that long-term, it actually makes anything underlying worse. So a client comes in and says, you know, you ask them any problems, go, oh, yeah, well, I do have a bit of a knee issue and I can't really bend below parallel. A lot of the, a lot of the um, personal trainers, be it good, bad or indifferent, will turn around and say, okay, well, let's just not do any exercise that involves you going below parallel in a knee bend because we don't want to aggravate it three four five weeks later they've probably still got the same problem and yes they might be a little bit fitter and all the rest of it but nothing's got better as it were so from a holistic point of view you know from my perspective you need to deal with those injuries and not only correct them as they stand but put in some sort of preventative measure because if it's like, I don't know, say your hamstrings are too tight, your posterior chain is too tight and that's why you're getting knee issues, that needs to be worked on a regular basis because those people are sat on a desk or, you know, in a car or whatever regularly and they don't ever get that stretch going on. So, but, th but this is what's confusing for me. A client comes in and a trainer says, right, we're going to spend the next hour mobilising and stretching we're not going to do any exercise today because that's what's best for you. And they're not getting what they want out of it. They think that what they need is to be sweating buckets when they get out and, oh, yeah, I've had a good session. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right in what you've done is setting up something that trains professionals to understand there's another dimension to this whole thing. And if you want a long-term client for a start, which obviously is going to be financially worth worth uh, money to you, um, but someone who's going to recommend you because you're not just about, right, let's go and beast you in the gym for an hour and, you know, whatever problems you have for the next week until I see you again, you can deal with. By, yeah. by, by actually being able to treat things from a rehab and a prevention point of view, 
it, it just adds such a, a more important dimension to things. And, and also, sorry, it also gives a value to that to that trainer. I'm, and I don't want to come across as trying to sell your course because I'm not. All I, all I get frustrated with is seeing people in big chains, David Lloyd, Virgin Active, all the rest of it, who are sat there and you can clearly see that that person is not squatting properly. And yet they are repeating volume through that person over and over again because they want to get through the hour. And it, and it just it's just frustrating. Well, I, I completely agree with pretty much everything you've said, if I remember it all correctly. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's a couple of issues here. That I, and when you were saying value as well, it, it used to be, and you probably still can if you, if you search hard enough, you can probably do a personal training uh, qualification while sat in your pyjamas in front of, in front of a computer. Now... This is changing right now. So the, an institution called Simspa uh, has taken over, uh, has tried to take over the register. It's got government funding. And uh, what they're doing is, is developing an entirely new uh, set of standards for personal training. So it's not the individual's fault necessarily who are not equipped, but where on earth do they go? Because it's not in their basic training. No. And then when you look out into the ether of an unregulated industry, there is a wealth of training that's just rubbish. I'm sorry, I've seen some mm. of it. I've, I've downloaded some of it to, to make it's a part of my research. And you know, some of it's really not just not very good. Some of it's incorrect, uh, and it's not keeping up with uh, current research. So there's a, there's a couple of issues, and 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 I think one of them is a the standards of personal training and acknowledging that there are people in that profession are so passionate about it. They want you to have a long-term client. Definitely, they have a long-term career as well, mm. which demand a higher salary because you know what you're doing. So these people have had to search far and wide to access the best courses, the um, the most valued courses, and they're accurate. <laughs> To actually give them the practical skills, because you're working with people, the practical skills and the knowledge that enables them to deal with those problems, identify them, and then be able to deal with them. And importantly as well, know when to refer on to another professional. Now, that doesn't mean a cessation of that relationship with your client. It's like you're saying, it's a holistic approach. Yep. So the training that, just for example, the training that we do teaches these individuals, where they can contribute on a client's journey through, even through a clinical pathway, right? Talking about prevention, absolutely, kind of screening of <laughs> and identification of suboptimal movement patterns, which could bring about, once you start to increase loading and volume of training, um, niggles that they didn't have, or indeed if they've got a niggle, rather than, or, a, or a, a problem, rather than avoid it completely, thinking about the best strategy to approach that, which may or may not include them, but to, to kind of do that. And that's what's kind of driven on a basic level up to kind of up to now en masse. That's what the, the qualification, the personal training qualification kind of tells you to do. Stop there and refer on. Yeah. And it's not, not helpful. And I know that so many people are dissatisfied with that. Like, And shielding knowledge and information uh, doesn't help anybody. So by talking to them, um, and explaining what injuries are, how they present, the population profiles, the risks, what the uh, consequences to muscle performance are and your training. It doesn't suddenly make these people, I don't know if they're assuming they're daft, it doesn't make them think that they're suddenly a clinician and they're, you know, they're qualified to diagnose and treat. It helps understanding a wider, wider problem. So the, as I was saying, the, the new the industry, the, or the body seems to far is seeking to do that and there'll be some new um, standards of personal training that are going to be released soon which will enable that to happen as a matter of course so that very basic level will come up and I, I'd encourage everybody who's a personal trainer to go and have a look at the, the Sims Papa website and, and to in fact register with them because um, they, that's their passion, their pursuit to bring up the standards and the providing all the, the education and training to go with that. Um, so, yeah, check that out. And, and sorry, Claire, what's it's, it called? Uh, yeah. Simspa, C-I-M-S-P-A. 
for the Chartered Institute of Sports Management and Physical Activity. Right. I think that's right. <laughs> and so, an interest in what you said about <laughs> referring out, you know, I do a very small amount of training with one-to-one clients now. And, um, yeah, it is very, very sporadic. But when there are issues, I will I use a really good osteopath locally to me. And I will go with them to the meeting, to the consult. Between us... We will assess the client, see what's going on, so we understand exactly what the issues are, and then um, carry out any rehabilitation stuff or injury prevention or whatever else has to happen. So getting people to understand you can refer out, and actually it's really important to do so, is another massive issue that, that PTs tend not to do because they feel as though they're losing their value by doing that. But in actual fact, they're bringing in an, an expert in something that they can work with that allows them to improve their their job. I, you know, for, for my guy around the corner, I think he's brilliant and, and I'll refer anyone to him. Mm, yeah, I'm sorry you broke up a little bit there, but if, if um, I understand correctly what you were saying is that you, know, you, you work closely with an osteopath, you attend uh, possibly the consultations with them or at least to have that working relationship with them. So together you can come up with a solution that fits your client's problem. And um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I encourage... Everybody, you know, if you're a personal trainer, fitness professional, Forge shows links with those other professions yeah. because, as you were saying there, it enhances, it, it's it, it's not that you're referring them on to another personal trainer, you're referring them on to somebody who's got expertise that you don't have. And that presents the best solution as a, as a client. Now, you put yourself in that client shoes, you, you recognize that you need a remedy, you don't know what it is. If you go to, well, me, who goes, look, I can help you to this point here, then I think what we need to do, if it, this doesn't have an effect, or this, you've still got the, the knee pain, and after a couple, four weeks or something of doing this exercise that we're doing, then I think you should go see this person here who will be able to assess you. So, for, for example, physiotherapist, um, underlying, see if there's any underlying clinical issues, and you present that, that solution for that client individually. They're going to recognize, certainly I would, I'd recognize that that person, that personal trainer has got my best interests at heart. Mm. I want to continue exercising. I've come to see you for a reason. Not only are you providing me with a training package and you're able to accommodate this injury and help try and make it better, um, you're going to give me uh, advice about where to go to you know, further my treatment uh, or further my uh, rehabilitation. I'm going to go back to you, you know, to start with. So it... It's a, like you're saying, it's a holistic approach uh, to that, that client rather than, I suppose, <laughs> keep, keep them and uh, you're looking for those long-term relationships with, with clients so that they're more meaningful rather than the quick interventions and the short, sharp interventions and having to refer on because you're, you're, you're fearful of, of approaching somebody else. From, from, your, from your experience, what is the scale of people that have some sort of rehabilitative injury that we're not or, or are not getting treated through sessions like that and I'll, I'll tell you what I'm trying to do really is let's find out what the scale of the problem is and also how do individuals I think the second part of the question is how does an individual find a trainer that knows how to improve them basically right. okay so 30% of GP consultations are for musculoskeletal problems so that's involving really? muscles or uh, tendons, joints, ligaments, that kind of thing. Um, we can't say exactly how many, you know, it's really difficult to put an absolute figure on it, but it's um, And it's been estimated almost 70 to 80% of those consultations, those people don't need to see a GP. What they need is some sort of uh, tailored exercise intervention that... Um, treats and or conditions certainly conditions um to help mitigate the, those those problems so if it's a let's take an example of anterior knee pain so a generic aching at the front of the knee it's not associated with osteoarthritis why on earth does that happen you go to the gps they go here's you know they don't have the resources they don't have the the money to employ physios or conditioning specialists in their their practices which I think, if we look at it, it's quite a short-sighted view because it will save hundreds of thousands. Nonetheless, 
they go away with the paracetamols, those person people stop exercising, the problem gets a little bit better, they start exercising again, the problem gets worse, and it gets worse than it was before because of deconditioned in the meantime. Anterior knee pain is just an aching at the front of the knee caused by the maltracking of the patella up and down the joint. So that means that the the kneecap moves up and down. If you've got a groove on your, your thigh, uh, your thigh bone, it shouldn't go up and down in a straight line on that groove. If you've got an imbalance in the musculature around the, the quads, uh, or on the quads of so the lateralis versus medialis, and though you've got a weakness in the gluteus medius that's causing an internal rotation of that, that can make that knee pain come on and make it really unpleasant to a point where just sitting is really uncomfortable. So long car journeys, sitting in lectures, that kind of thing, really aching. The only thing will bring relief is if you straighten the knee. That can be remedied simply by appropriate conditioning of those muscles and a bit of stretching. It's that simple. Yeah. Not not all problems are that, that simple, but will involve a, a remedy like that. So um, the some of the other facts and figures. So musculoskeletal problems cause um, something like 30.6 million days lost of uh, to work through absenteeism. Wow. And the cost, cost of that is nearly 7.4 billion pounds. So there's an economic cost. Amazing. Right? There's a cost to the individual because they aren't doing what they like to do. They are missing work maybe. There's a cost to the NHS. So uh, we're talking about knee replacements, for example. Uh, 90,000 knee replacements happen per year that are primary, not revisions. Um, that's figures rising. Uh, the cost of that, billions again. It's, uh, hip fracture alone costs the UK, um, it costs 2.2 billion pounds to, to treat. So we're talking some, some massive figures, some massive economic impact, an individual impact, and we still haven't got a solution. The NHS has recognised this and published something called the Five Year Forward View. Um, they've estimated conservatively that in um, two years' time from when it was published, there's going to be a death of um, £30 billion pounds of services required and services that are, are able to be produced. Uh, and delivered, and some of that is musculoskeletal, and actually that figure is too small now to recognise. Right. So we're seeing it's not getting better, it's not getting worse, but we still recognise we've got a problem. Hey, look, who sees these problems on a daily basis? Who could open their doors to a brand new market of people? Yeah. It's, it's it's the fitness profession. We don't need to establish a new fitness profession. Uh, sorry, a new profession. We need to upskill those people that are really passionate about kind of helping people in it for the long term. I was cert, you know keen to learn more and help people and build their business. So for me, that has got to be the solution. Um, it's, it's not very costly at all. And actually everybody should should win, including that person, especially that person who's got the problem. So in terms of prevalence, that's that's what we're looking at. Um, it's, it's, abs- it's absolutely huge. 380,000 sport injuries in excess of are treated in A&E uh, per year. And that's obviously somebody's got a sports injury that don't always go to the to A&E so massive probably underestimation there yeah so, yeah big problem <laughs> so so interestingly then you took it upon yourself to put a course together for fit pros and yeah. say look let's educate you guys let's get you to understand a bit more about what's going on from your knowledge and and whatnot tell us a bit about that program and course and qualification that you've put together because it it's very um it covers a lot of things that people might not necessarily think would be covered in something like that. Yeah, okay, happily. Yeah, um, it, it basically does what I've, I've tried to explain. It resources fitness professionals to be able to, at the very first thing, feel comfortable in training somebody who's got an MSK problem, a musculoskeletal problem. Um, some people are very fearful because it's drilled into them. Refer on, don't touch them. Then, yeah. And you're going to break them. Believe me, if somebody's in pain, they won't do something. Okay, and as long as you know, you should be trained to a level where you're not prescribing really dangerous exercise or with very very poor technique. So it it gives a level of comfortableness and confidence. And what it does, the first level of training resources you to be able to deal with a, an array of complaints, recover. So it's in, it's in three modules. So the first module, there's two online and one in-person practical. So 
question. And the, the module uh, that comes first gives, again, that information about injury, what types of injury. We cover five injuries in detail and touch on some others. Those common injuries you are like to, likely to see, um, ankle sprain, early onset osteoarthritis of the knee, anterior knee pain, those kind of things. We explain as well um, what happens when you are in pain, what happens if you've got swelling in the joint, because um, that influences how your muscles activate and it influences how effective you can be with your training. So you, you, know, you need to be aware of that. So you might be, like you're saying, beasting somebody, but if they've got a little bit of swelling in the knee, their muscle capacity is shut down by between 10 and 30%. And there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. So just to be aware of those kind of things. Um, and then we look at population profiles, we look at signs and symptoms, and coming on then to looking at case studies and how you would practically intervene to accommodate that injury. What can you do um, that's not contraindicative to the problem? And at the very least, you know, work around it. But there's so many strategies you can employ thinking about different types of muscle activation. You've got isometric, you've got eccentric, you've got concentric. Not everything has to be a lift and lower. You can work around a problem. You know, if, it, if a person's got pain um, at a particular in a particular range, you can work either side of that. So we give people the strategies to be able to try out and use. Um, the second model looks at that scope of practice. So where do you sit as a, in a fitness as a fit professional? who's upskilled to manage injury and accommodate injury in that treatment pathway. So if you are working with somebody who's in a clinical treatment pathway, who's been to see their GPs for something, uh, and then you go on to then perhaps see a physio, and then you go on to maybe see a surgeon, where can you contribute in that pathway? And actually, you should have the skills to be able to contribute everywhere. Um, and it resources you as well to be able to have the confidence to communicate with that clinical team, so probably mainly the, the physiotherapist there. Um, so again, providing that his, holistic solution for that individual. And then the third one is, is a practical session. So that's a whole day or a day and a half, depending which route you go, of putting into practice the strategies, working through case studies um, in a gym environment, because you're working with people, you've got to be in a gym environment yeah. or in an next environment. You've got to have those skills practically. So that's the first first layer of the, the course that injury or wire. So, and just let me say as well, we I was just going to say that that um, we're working and with some major healthcare, sorry, leisure and healthcare providers to to experiment with putting this into their service provision because they see it too. Imagine there's a big leisure facility. Um, You've got people that are injured there. I went for a meeting at one uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this woman on the way in was limping past me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> There's a client. How do you help her stop stop her uh, suspending her membership? Yeah. You know, so there's interest to those providers too. Um, so, um, and in addition to that, we're, we're talking to uh, other people in, in public health and clinical commissioning groups to try and experiment again with putting that in more formally. So if you individually, you can take on and do that training straight away. But um, the the interest, the wider interest within those, those um, organizations that are perhaps more responsible for looking after these problems are, yeah, there, there is a brick to open and we really need a solution quickly. And I think the market is huge because you've got a lot of, healthcare professionals who can't deal with like you say the volume of people that are coming in with injuries and they're looking to pass it on to someone that can take that away from them and say look can you just go and deal with these people make them better stop them coming through my door because i've got some other stuff i've got to deal with and they're taking up you know 30 percent of gp uh, appointments and whatnot so i can i can see how it obviously if someone's serious about trying to create a better career within the fitness professional industry then it would be a a great route to take if it interests them in that perspective. Um, I think so, yeah, as well. And, and I also think that that commands a, an increase, well, it, you will retain a, a, another level and layer of skills and, and knowledge, which for me automatically commands a, a higher premium. So it's not your 12 pounds an hour for me, I'm sorry. I think it's more like, you know, 40. <laughs> And it, it, fitness professionals who have the, they've got to have more confidence in themselves. Absolutely. Not everybody's like this, but, but 
if you've got those skills, knowledge, and capability, I've seen some amazing results with people who are they're not charging in enough, and they're not charging enough because the industry is flooded with people, some of which don't want to stay, and they're in the twelve pound an hour job, and they get you know, it, unfortunately, you know, there's there's so many personal trainers around that that people. You know, the, the, the average salary has probably come down over the years. I, I don't know exactly, but I'm guessing that. If you are seeking out those other, maybe nutrition as well, and other um, courses that enhances your level of education, enhances your level of uh, skills and abilities to be able to deal with people who aren't your standard, healthy, fit individual with no problem at all, mm. they're not overweight, to deal and train them, put them through a boot camp, uh, if you've got probably like the majority of us have got other surrounding issues. If you can accommodate those and maybe even get them better, you know, surely that's worth more. I'd pay more for that. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, a twelve pound an hour PT is someone who's employed by uh, a club. Someone who is independent and runs their own business, you know, from my perspective, we'd want to charge sixty to seventy five pound an hour and then, you know, more depending on what your skill set is. So and then people don't like doing it because they feel as though they can't charge that money because they're coming from a, a background that says you're only worth 12, 15 pounds. Honestly, right. I, from my perspective, it's at least 60, if not 75 pounds an hour. And and I very, very rarely do it. And I pick and choose because it's not my passion and my interest so much, um, depending on what the person's trying to achieve. However, um, with the ability to... to charge more comes a uh, a perspective of status as well so people get to see and understand how good that person is and how professional they are rather than just someone that walks around a club and you know does the same training for every person that comes in the door all day because they they have no reason to change it because they don't have no knowledge to change it um so i get it and i understand why fitness professionals should know more and should educate themselves in everything, be it nutrition or rehab. No, I'm not just just to have a caveat there. I'm not. I'm not bashing personal trainers at all. I'm just saying that if those people that, that are really keen and really passionate about what they do, yeah, the, there are avenues that you can pick that will accelerate you along there, stand you out from a massive, massive crowd. Yeah. like you were saying there, charge more. People expect more. You can deliver more. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, away from the the personal trainers, yeah. going to individuals who may well have injuries or mm-hmm. um, are listening to this and thinking, Do you know, what? actually, my knee gives me problems, or my lower back is always an issue, or I have this sciatica, or I've been told it's sciatica, but I'm not really sure, or my shoulders are a bit tight, or whatever else it is. Firstly. What's the best way for them to find a good trainer that you think might be able to deal with them? That's a really good question. Um, so ask me that in, a, in about a year's time. We should have a, a, yeah. a volume. Anyone with your qualification, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> in the I mean, we've got people on the books already, but clearly that we need a bigger solution and that's what we're trying to mobilise with, with partners. Um, in the meantime, if you're one of these people that's got an issue um (laughs) what do you do about it so it it can depend as well on on what the problem is and how it's developed i'm assuming here we're talking about active individuals people probably tuned into this podcast are more likely to be those people are passionate about exercise exercise defines them as in it's a part of who they are certainly for me you know that kind of thing so if you are impaired in some way you've got a problem what do you do about it and from personally, what I would say is to keep yourself sane, <laughs> um, can you work around that? Can you cross train? So a lot of people are quite focused. I've got to do this, particularly uh, maybe individual athletes or uh, people who've got really defined training plans, runners, or uh, you've know, got to do this in this way. You know, Think outside the box. What can you do that's different? So if impact hurts, cycle, you know, that kind of thing. You can still get a good workout doing something that's different um, or train slightly differently to avoid that pain and that's what we're teaching people to do so you can do that for yourself um, in addition to that to look at the issue itself um, I would say 
think about uh, do you know anybody who in the fitness profession or anybody who's seen anybody in the fitness profession who's been helpful so that kind of person that we're talking about the injury aware personal trainer who has maybe got some solutions for you and the wherewithal and relationships to work in unison with somebody else yeah. just like you were saying that you do and uh, I know other people do they do exist they definitely do exist um, how they set themselves out from the crowd might be quite difficult to identify um, the other thing would be to go see um, a good physiotherapist so that you are able to get an idea of what the problem is what the cause is and what the solution might be now they probably won't provide you with a training plan they'll probably give you some exercises to help remedy um, the the issue so for example rotator cuff in the shoulder is such a, a good example and a common problem um, a lot of people who are younger statistically train through it and it gets worse yeah. uh, so you go and see somebody you've probably had that problem for six months um, it's probably going to take as um, same amount of time to get better uh, as long as you kind of approach it in the right way um, which isn't necessarily training through it so try and find those specialists and I said physiotherapy is a good first port of call and again if you've got any um, like personal recommendations from people that have had a similar issue or a musculoskeletal problem that's sports orientated um, ask for those recommendations so those are the, the, the three things and ultimately as well don't as an individual train through that, that pain okay so don't try and you know if you do something it makes it worse that's a, a good marker to say don't, don't yeah, do it again absolutely. back on or do it in a slightly different way Sorry, something I was I was going to say earlier. I'm going back to the fit pros again now. People in pain tend to pay more money because they want to get rid of it, and it's not about you know rinsing people for every penny they've got, but it's about having the ability to say right, I'm going to spend the time with you to get this fixed because it's worth everybody's while. Like, there's no point in saying right, we've only got 55 minutes. So I'm going to try and get everything in and it's very little money and so on and so forth. If someone turns around and says, right, listen, we need to see you three times a week for the next three weeks, but we're going to be able to fix this problem long term. And there's a there's a, an amount of money that's going to cost. You know, the client's willing to pay it because they want to get fixed. And the trainer is able to then put the time, effort and value into that session because they know it's it's worthwhile as opposed to trying to rush somebody out the door yeah it's about setting expectations as yeah. well isn't it so the uh, trainer might feel slightly uh, impaired in the fact that they've got only 55 minutes once a week with this person and that person expects not only to try and have their problem solved but also they want to feel knackered at the end of the yeah. session you know, something so it's about managing expectations so that interaction that first interaction when you're talking about this problem whether it be a new client or whether it be a client that's just developed something um then you say well okay i think on balance i don't know because i don't know and nobody knows for certain um i think you probably need like you're saying for example three sessions um for three weeks and what we will do in that is x y and z and the aim would be to have you better if we can at that point there if not if we, if we come into you know for halfway through and we're nowhere you know it's not getting any better um then at that point um we'll probably look to get somebody else involved as well and so they you know i take advice all the time i've got my clinical go-to's and i don't by any stretch know anything and i know so many people more, know more in certain areas than i do i will take that mm. share information love working collaboratively as a part of the team um personally i love it and also i know it's the best thing for that person i'm dealing with so um do that as a personal trainer and tell your client that you're going to do that too i i've been injured i would have paid anything yeah you know, to, you know i had a, a really really bad uh, back injury i've had surgeries for the knees and stuff but this was, was so bad um i was almost stupidly as a scientist bargaining with myself i'd do anything to be able to run again you know i'll probably say well look, deadlift anymore or that kind of thing but there's that desperation because it's a part of who you are and if you go to somebody that goes look i will try getting better i've got these techniques and this strategy you go right okay you've got a plan yeah 
tell me what your plan is. Okay, I invest in that plan. I know there's not 100% guarantee, and I know that at this point I'm going to go down that route, rather than just going to different individuals at different points of time. You get a sporadic opinion. You don't get a, a longitudinal uh, look at your condition and how you progressed over time. So a- absolutely, um, about setting, you know, set expectations in that interaction with, you, with your client. Um, and you know you, you'll develop a, a good working relationship there. And as a recipient of that training, and also being on the other side in terms of that injury, you want that plan of attack. Have, have, have you got a um, uh, the, the, the facility? If someone wants to find one of your qualified practitioners, are they able? Is, are people able to contact you guys, and, and you can refer them out to people if they're listening to this and thinking, Do you know what, I really want someone that's gone through Claire's course. And I want to uh, speak to them. Can I just get in contact and you can give so, me some details? Yeah, if you can, please do get in contact with me. Either if you are injured, or indeed if you want to find out more about injury aware training, um, I could just write a general question. Do welcome all communications. I love talking about this stuff, um, and I love helping people. The longer term plan, because obviously with this is um, a relatively new pathway, is to have um, a referral platform. So as you qualify with us you'll be a member of Get Back to Sport. And what we will do is have that client referral as well. Now that's not mobilized yet and it's fairly local. Uh, and we've got people that are kind of positioned, um, I guess sporadically around the country, more localized perhaps from Nottingham, but around the country we do have the um, of people that have done, uh, done some training that we'll be able to help out with. So, um, and also if, if you're those people with injury, again, I encourage you to get in touch with me because that means there's a demand in your area. Yeah. Right? If you're looking for that, tell me about it and I'll try and get you a solution. And I'll go up to these these guys in, the, in let's say, uh, Surrey or uh, wherever you are, Greenwich or uh, Scotland, Aberdeen. Tell me about it and I will get in touch with a fitness profession in your community. Oh, look, you've got clients waiting. You know, let's upskill you. And if there's somebody in your area, certainly I'll put you in touch. Okay, and and do you have a way of doing any online con- consultations with people? Because I know I get a lot of um, inquiries globally. You know, literally, we have, I have clients in the States, Australia, Europe, um, listen to this podcast, get in contact and so on. So if people obviously aren't going to be local to the UK, but still want to contact you because obviously you've got a huge amount of experience in it, are they able to do that? Certainly, yeah. I run a, a remote rehab service actually, um, so that's over the over Skype or FaceTime. Um, so if you've got a, an injury, uh, you've got a, um, you post surgery and you're not rehab properly, you don't feel like you can literally get back to sport, or actually looking for uh, preventative strategies if you've got a big volume of training coming up, um, do get in touch. Um, I've worked predominantly mainly with people who've got injuries and a rehab problem because it's that that if you've got that um it's that trigger point to get in, you know do something about it yeah. so people are more likely to invest into in likely to invest into cure rather than prevention because you've not got a problem yet it doesn't seem to present naturally on the high on the list of priorities so yes get in touch with me uh, you can get in touch with my website or um i'm sure we'll be able to um pass on my email but it's just literally info at dot uh, info at get back to sport.com or www.getbacktosport.com and yes i run a remote rehab service which um will involve a consultation first off we just have a chat to find out whether or not i can help you because again we're talking about fleecing individuals that's just not on yeah. i like helping people if i can help you i will if i can't i'll pass you on to some people i know i can and then um we will after that discussion, put together a plan. It usually works in uh, month um, rollovers, so you'll uh, get a rehab plan from me, and we will uh, keep in contact for once a week um, by FaceTime or Skype uh, each each week for a month, and through email and, and other me- methods as well. And uh, so we just got the opportunity there to catch up on what you've done. Send exchange films of how you're doing the, the exercises, any issues, tailor the plan, and then we'll look to see whether you need to go on for another month. Um, 
I mean, you can roll up like that, but yes, Brilliant. depending on what the, 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 pro, the problem is, you might provide a, a short intervention or perhaps a bit more of a spread out intervention, but less touch points. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to um, start asking you some questions for my own benefit now. It's enough of all this fitness pro stuff. Let's talk CrossFit and why we are so injured all the time when we are doing stuff. Actually, that's not true. We're not injured all the time, but um, it's certainly, I mean, I know we've had a long conversation about this in the past and it's known for its injury and it's known for um, uh, poor technique and whatnot. Um, and it's a growing sport, right? I mean, you know, it. I think this year nearly 400,000 people entered the CrossFit Open um, which is the which is the qualifier right. to get to the games, and they are just yeah. the people that entered. They're not the people that take part. So you could probably triple or quadruple that in in amount of people that actually do the sport, as it were. Um, and I'm really interested in prevention of injuries, so that I can train, yeah. as opposed to this hurts now. How do I fix it? Yeah. So, to, you know, You've probably been injured before, haven't you? So you know what it's like to be out. That's why that's silly for me. You know, like the absolutely the prevention, recognize the, the, the value of it once you've been yeah. injured. Unfortunately, and I've got, and then currently I've got a lower back issue, which has been niggling me for a while. A osteopath has said, "How much longer do you need to be doing this until you decide you're going to give it a rest?" In other words, you know, you need a rest for a while to get this inflammation down and stop it from causing more problems. So when did you want to do that exactly? Because he knows that I'm still going to be training and whatnot. So anyway, it's a long story. I've got something I need to do in two weeks time. I've, I've really cut back on any sort of Olympic lifting and things like that. There's no weight, not, not heavy weight stuff involved. There's a lot of engine building going on at the moment. Um, trying to protect it until this event. And once that's done, then there'll be some rest and rehab going on post that. Yesterday, we're doing some gymnastic work and there was a lot of hanging off of bars. And I'll tell you what, my shoulders just felt tight and tired and all the rest of it. And you just think, all right, so if it's not my back, it's my shoulders. If it's not my shoulders, it's my ankle flexion. If it's not this. So, you know, it's it's just normal, I guess. When people train regularly, they're going to come up with stiffness and tightness and so on. From your perspective, what's the best way to approach this on a on a practical level for people? That, that's a wide question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it, it depends. It's, again, the caveat it depends. So what is it that you're doing? How long are you doing it for? Um, the volume. So let me give you some examples. Um, so what you just do what you were talking about there you do you do a sport that involves multiple bodily parts multiple um muscles and in multiple modalities so from being in uh, an isometric position so the way that the, the muscle isn't lengthening or shortening it but it's contracted extremely hard in a in a static position to hold a position through to loading it whilst it's lengthening so when you're hanging from a from a bar, um, the muscle is in a lengthened position. Um, so, you know, it's, at some point, the under eccentric load. Um, but generally, that's the lowering of the weight. And then the concentric part is when you kind of lifting the muscle gets shorter. Um, so, if you're training multiple body parts in multiple different, then that's very different to being training to run in a straight line. Yeah. So you've got different demands and you've got different expectations on the body and you could argue that you're amplifying it in every single position joint that you're working. So potentially, um, I don't know the stats on this, whether or not it's true, but potentially the risk of injury might be slightly greater, might not be depending on volume, I don't know. But the things to do to help mitigate injury, so we want to try and prevent injury, think about what the activity is that you're doing and be specific i want don't want to be injured it means nothing yeah it's like goal setting right yeah, yeah. So, uh, you need to be specific so let's say we'll take the example of crossfit you've heard about crossfit you want to go and do it because it looks awesome everybody's told you how how great it is um you need to make sure that what you do 
your body is capable of being able to do it, not just once, but over a repeated period of time. So you need to be resilient against injury. So we spoke before about, about kipping, where you're putting the shoulder joint under uh, quite a lot of load um, and at speed and in extreme ranges of motion. Now, if a person was to go and do that repetitiously, having never conditioned their shoulders in those extreme ranges to accommodate those loads, then it's not surprising that injury might, might present itself because you're putting that stress and strength through those tissues that aren't accommodated to, to deal with it. So think about a simple example to, to, um, or something to exemplify would be lifting a weight because we can understand that. If you sat on a knee extension machine and you lift a weight and you can lift it and you can lower it with appropriate technique and you've done that time in, time out, you've done it over you know, months, your body's probably accommodated to that, okay? You will be able to lift it. <clears throat> now, if you go to the gym, having never lifted before, and you try and lift that weight, that, that this example here uh, was lifted repetitiously, you won't be able to do it because your body's not accommodating, or not accommodated to do it. Or if you can do it, the body will be like, oh my God, how do I deal with this? And the way that the, the loading is presented through that muscle and through the tendons and through the connective tissue won't be suboptimal. And the way that the muscles are firing won't be suboptimal. So all I'm saying is you need to build up uh, your resilience, putting a lot of groundwork to get up to that point where you've got either the flexibility or you've got the ability to tolerate those loads. But importantly, you've got the ability to tolerate those loads in extreme ranges. Mm. So you might be flexible, but can you control those? Uh, have control of those end ranges? So I set up some um, functional conditioning classes here in, in Nottingham with uh, uh, a friend called uh, Max Riley. He's got the gymnastic background. Um, I've got the neuromuscular background. We were training people to be resilient at those extended ranges of positions. So if you think about a tennis player who's who's um, able to take forehand shots in a really um, abducted uh, uh, ab yeah, abducted uh, positioning of the, the shoulder joint um, and you know you've got some rotation going in there as well and it's accommodating the load that's the balls being hit at speed to this tennis bracket and it's got a lever on top of it and you've got uh, the the shoulder being uh, stretched you need the resilience of that soft tissue as well as the, the muscle to accommodate that and then deliver a response yeah okay so I, th I think oh, I, I think one of the things that we miss is when people come into a sport of any kind, right? Whether it be CrossFit or whether it be tennis or whether it's just going to the gym and keeping fit, whatever else it is, we tend to want to get ahead of ourselves before we can accommodate, like you say, the load we're putting on ourselves. So, for example, you know, you see people doing kipping pull-ups or you see people doing snatch or overhead squats or whatever else it is and you're encouraged to try and do your best at it yes and oftentimes we're not really prepared for that we're not ready for it just yet we still need to do some hip mobility work we still need to loosen off our shoulders because all we're used to is chest pressing and now we've got such invert you know tight pecs and uh, and shoulders and stuff that we can't get our hands behind ourselves and on that point interestingly the regional qualifiers for the game. So CrossFit Games have a um, an open, which is open to everyone. The the top uh, 60 people of each region go to a regional event and then the top from there go to the games. They've just had six people in the regionals that took place last weekend tear a peck. And they did it doing ring dips. So getting into a very, very deep dip on rings multiple times with volume. And these are very conditioned athletes, right? So here's my problem. As a, as a layman crossfitter, someone that just goes and does a bit for leisure and whatnot, it's not difficult to watch people at a very high level and want to emulate them. So not only do we not have the conditioning to do it, but some of the stuff they're doing is dangerous for them anyway. So we, we've got a perception that, you know, oh yeah, we've got to be able to do ring dips, we've got to do muscle ups, we've got to be able to do handstand push-ups and all the rest of it. And 
we rush into it without doing the groundwork because some of that groundwork is painful and boring, right? If you've got a lacrosse ball in your back and you're rolling on it, that, you know, brings tears to your eyes and you don't want to do it for very long, never mind months of it. So we tend to not spend the time laying the groundwork so that we can we can execute properly. And then when you're potentially in a class under a time pressure with other people around you, your technique goes and all the rest of it. I'm not bashing CrossFit. I love it. I do it very often. It's my thing. However, I also understand, you know, how much care and attention people need to put into it, which I don't think we do. And it's the same for any sport, right? If you're playing tennis and you're very tight through your shoulder, or, you know, your your forearms are very tight, you're going to get tennis elbow. You're going to get some sort of issue going on because you haven't stretched them, you haven't rolled them, you haven't made sure that they're capable of handling that load, as you say, never mind on a high volume repetitious basis. So I think... Yeah, go on. I was just going to say something that we've not touched on at all that is of paramount importance, again, that falls off the list, is rest. Yeah. So you rest your muscles, you know what that feels like. So if you've got the, you know, the hydrogen build up through lactic acid production, you know, you can feel that nasty, horrible feeling and you can feel it wear off, right? So you think, ah, we're recovered, okay. What mm. you don't feel and what you can't see is the... Um, fatigue if you like that goes through the tendons and goes through the ligaments and that builds up over time so let me give you an example um where that's you know scientifically evaluated the um okay let's take lower back pain and yeah. um, the lower back conveyor workers so people working on a conveyor belt and forgive me this it is relevant although we're not talking about sport but we're looking at the, the tissue uh, properties so people are kind of lent over a conveyor for you know eight hours a day doing assembly work, suffer from low back pain. It's not you know rocket science to kind of work out why, but when we do work out why and look at the evidence, what we see is um, the tissue, the soft tissue. Forget about the muscles for a minute. We're talking about the ligaments here that keep the integrity of the joints together. As you put load through it through any ligament, if you like, or, or tendon, you constantly load it. So in that flex position there, it's under load, and it's under load, and it's under load, and it's under load, and it's for eight hours, right? So then you rest, you come back, and you go to bed, and you sleep for a bit. Does that tendon recover, so, oh, sorry, does that ligament recover, such that when you go back the next day, do another shift, you're doing the same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing, and then repeat that cycle. It doesn't, okay? So what you've got is... Uh, it's called creep. Yeah. So the length, if you take a piece of string and you, you put a weight on the end of it, you will see, even though it's not elastic, after about an hour, that weight will be hanging lower. That's the same thing within ligaments and tendons within the body. So if you're leaning forward, you're putting that load through a ligament and it will extend. That causes is a neuromuscular dysfunction as well. It makes the, muscle, uh, the muscles around the spine fire differently. So you go to bed, hopefully rest, you're right away in the next day. Well, there's a cumulative effect because that creep, that, that change in tissue compliance doesn't um, fully get better with the, the rest cycle. So if you apply that to sports and think about, oh, yeah, well, I don't do that, you know. Yeah. But what you do, do, think about running or any repetitious activity, you're putting load through ligaments and tendons, and it's quicker. So the, the force that goes through the tendons might be the... The, the vol uh, sorry, the, the loading is the same, but actually because it's quicker, it's got an increased load through the, the tissue. So you're doing something repetitiously. So put, apply that to whatever sport you do. Um, and you do that, and then you do a, a volume of that. And you do a volume of that day after day or every other day for a long period of time. At some point, you're going to need a rest, not to enable the skeletal muscle to recover. Yeah, yeah, but I, yeah, I take enough protein, I take my lysine and glutamine, and I take everything, you know, the aminos, acids, and builders, and whatever. Well, that doesn't necessarily address what's going on in the ligaments and tendons, and it's those that keep your joint together and yeah. keep your muscles attached to your, to your bones. So we need to make sure there's enough time in there to enable the tissues that don't contract to uh, recycle, repair, 
and accommodate that load. So just the same as a muscle gets bigger, stronger to lift more, the tendon through a, a resistance training program also gets stronger to accommodate more. It takes a little bit more time, however, than it does for skeletal muscle. So we just need to be mindful of that. Also, they decondition like skeletal muscles do yeah. as well. So you, again, if you took yourself back into a, 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 a sports situation that involves quite high loading, lots of loading at extreme ranges, you know, your tendons and ligaments aren't going to um, thank you for that. So just be mindful as well, things that we can't see that bring about a lot of injuries or we sustain a lot of injuries to them is possibly as well because we're not thinking about rest and recovery in a way that we should be doing so typically rest and recovery get your breath back stop that burn um eat your protein and you know drink your drinks you know for recovery for for you know performance perspectives but we're not necessarily thinking about the really important things that enable us to perform yeah. that keeps our body together longevity and also stop comparing yourself to elite athletes and trying to do what they're doing because they are spending you know all day every day training and then trying to recover as much as possible with every technique under the sun whereas you're going to the gym putting your you know having a shower putting your clothes back on and going and sitting at a desk for eight hours so people have got to get that kind of perception on it um listen it would we could keep talking for hours because i find this fascinating and um and i know you're busy but um so www.getbacktosport.com is your website right and uh, if people want to email you, it's info at the same address. I know you're you're on Twitter and Facebook yeah. as well. And what I'll do is I'll put the uh, links to that in in the show notes. People can uh, click on there and, and and get in contact with you or, or friends request you or whatever else it is. Um, yeah, we'll do that. It's a Facebook page as well. Forget about spot doing. So uh, don't. Uh, some, sometimes people people are hesitant at doing that. Uh, um, please don't. I, I like talking about this as you can probably tell and also as well if if we were talking going back to that point you were saying about well i've got an injury but i don't know where to go to tell yeah. me i'll try to do something about it either individually with you or set up something in your in your area so please do get in touch yeah okay brilliant listen thank you so much for today um we will definitely be speaking soon personally but um until then um thanks again and um we'll speak soon